Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Regina Roebuck, and I'm the Executive Director of the American Beekeeping Federation. I want to welcome you to tonight's conversation with a beekeeper. We have uh, Peter, Pete Burleson um, talking about creating critical pollinator habitats for honeybees and monarch butterfly partnerships. Just want to give you a couple of housekeeping items. You are on mute. However, that does not preclude you from asking a question. Put it in the chat box or the question box, and I will um, put it in the queue, and we'll ask all questions at the end. So tonight's speaker, um, Peter, is the Director of Habitat for Partnerships with Pheasant Forever. His current role, he works with the organization and its staff to develop expanding partnerships that help develop the organization's mission. An organization pri priority is to pursue part opportunities that positively impact and establish high quality habitats for pollinator species. Prior to an employment with Pheasant Forever, Pete's work, um, work experience in included employment with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services in North Dakota, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, and the U.S. Forest Service in Michigan. So he's traveled quite a bit. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Pete. Thank you, Regina. Um, welcome, everybody, and thank you to the ABF for this opportunity to talk about something that I'm kind of passionate about. So tonight's webinar, as Regina mentioned, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, pollinator habitat and uh, some key factors to providing good pollinator habitat. And then on the second half of it, I'm going to talk about a new uh, pollinator partnership that Pheasants Forever and some other key partners are part of delivering uh, in the Midwest and Great Plains, and I'm uh, going to talk about that. So with that, I'll open with giving just a brief introduction about myself, since most of you probably don't know me. This is just a photo of myself and my wife as we're conducting a prescribed burn on uh, our land that is located in central Nebraska. We reside in the beautiful Lus Hills of central Nebraska. It's a rolling topography and is about 50% row crop, which is primarily corn, corn and soybeans, and 50% uh, rangeland. So I am uh, a landowner. I'm a wildlife biologist that has been with Pheasants Forever for a little bit better than uh, 25 years. And I am a very avid beekeeper, a novice beekeeper, uh, with a total of six hives uh, right now but uh, learning as I go. Uh, but the one thing that I am really passionate about is getting high quality habitat on the landscape with images uh, like this. High quality, high diverse habitat that can provide great benefits for pollinators. So in tonight's webinar, I'm going to kind of uh, talk about three different things, three different sections. The first is I'm going to talk and show a little bit about some of the changes that are happening on the landscape. And if you're a beekeeper or somebody that is interested in pollinator habitat, you've probably seen a number of changes happening on the landscape in the last decade. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about some pollinator habitat tools. And then I'll talk about that new habitat program that I referenced, the Honeybee and Monarch Butterfly Partnership. So with that, uh, let's jump into tonight's webinar. And the first thing that I'd like to talk about are some of the changes that are happening on the landscape. And if we take a look at um, the information from USDA that shows the top 10 states for honey production in the United States, and you take a look at that, North Dakota is usually number one. And the, the top three or four are uh, always kind of uh, right around there and real important. But if you take a look at that pie chart and you look at where those states come from, and then we take a look at a chart, a map that was put together by the U.S. Department of Agriculture that shows the area of the country during a four-year period from 2008 to 2011 where 24 million acres of land that was not in crop production, was converted 
into crop production, agricultural production. Uh, this is an area that is right in the very heart of our country and the very center of things, and there's a lot of changes happening on the landscape. And that area is really important to the discussion that we're going to have tonight because seven of the top ten honey-producing states reside in this part of our country, which is are happening very dramatically on the landscape. And just those seven states represent 57% of the honey that is produced in the country. So changes are happening in areas that are very key uh, to the success um, of honeybees, um, honey production in the country, and uh, survival of, of hives. So this is a very critical and important area of the country. And in the last decade, there's been lots and lots of changes that are happening on the landscape, all the way from this example where, yes, they do even farm the road, to things where we have uh, soil moving through the air, uh, air quality issues. We can have water quality issues um, on some of our fragile lands. And more commonly, an example of a field like this. In this example, if you can see my cursor, this area on the top where it's nice and flat up here has been in row crop production for many, many years and has been uh, valuable agricultural land. But in the last decade, this area along the side of the uh, field that used to be in rangeland like this area is now being put into crop production. And as you look at this photo, you can see uh, the soil erosion and other things that are happening in this field. And obviously, the production in this part of the field, because the soils are poorer and it's more prone to erosion, is not the same. These are the kind of areas that are represented by that 24 million acres of land that are being converted into production. And where I reside, in the central part of Nebraska. This is something that is happening on a very common and frequent basis. In 2012, Nebraska led the nation in the number of acres that were converted from rangeland, like in this picture, to cropland. In fields like this, that is uh, rolling topography and has always been in grassland, a mere 13 months later, this exact field that you're looking at in this imagery is converted to looking like this. And this is an example of the kind, some of the kind of changes that are happening on the landscape. And this is, if you're looking at this photo thinking that that is really dramatic and how could somebody make a decision like that, this landowner, even though this in the short term is a decision that um, he's not going to produce a lot of crop off of this, Financially, in the short term, this is a decision that this landowner made that will put more dollars in their pocket because this landowner on this field right here, even though it's not going to produce a lot of crop, they're going to financially uh, come out ahead because of federal crop insurance and they will be paid the county average yield on this field, um, whether they are producing a crop on there or not. So those are some of the things that are driving the many changes that are happening on the landscape. So if you're somebody that uh, cares about bees or pollinators or other wildlife, it doesn't matter if we are thinking about moving honeybees around the country for pollination or we're concerned about monarch butterflies and their migration route or we're thinking about a, an area of where are CRP acres in the, in the country or where are Pheasants Forever biologists located in the country, where is corn grown, and where are ethanol plants, or where did the tall grass prairie used to be present in the country. It doesn't matter what map we look at, all of these things that we're talking about are happening in the same area right here in the very heart and center of the country that's known as the Midwest and Great Plains. And that is where those changes are happening on a dramatic basis. 
a good beekeeper friend of mine is uh, Zach Browning with Browning Honey in uh, North Dakota. And one of the phrases that really kind of crystallized this issue for me that Zach said is that it seems like more and more honeybees and other forms of wildlife are really left with the scraps on the landscape. And that was a very dramatic uh, comment when I heard him say that for the first time. More and more high quality habitat and areas are becoming smaller and fewer on the landscape. So one of the things that my organization, Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, is interested in is if we are in fact left with the scraps on the landscape, we need to do everything that we can to make the scraps that remain the best that they can be. And that's one of the things that we'll talk a little bit about tonight and how pollinator habitat fits so nicely with this message right here of wanting to make the acres that remain into the best that they can be. So the next uh, part of the presentation, I'm going to give just a couple of keys about um, talking about if we want to have high quality pollinator habitat, some key considerations that we want to have in mind that we think about um, as we're developing habitat. And the first key consideration that I would talk to you about is that when we're establishing pollinator habitat, we want to make sure that we have flowering resources for the entire growing season. And in most cases in the Midwest and Great Plains, that's April to October. And this is a really important thing to think about because as you look at these wildflower images <clears throat> that are coming up on the screen, there's lots of diversity, lots of different color, lots of size, lots of shape, lots of diversity in there. But every one of these wildflowers flowers in the month of July. And if we design our habitat projects to just have species like this in here, we have not provided great pollinator habitat because we have not thought about the entire growing season from April to October. So it's really important that we make sure that we've thought about that entire growing season when we're designing high quality pollinator habitat. The next thing that we want to think about is the size, shape, and color of the different species that we're putting into our mixtures. Because um, when we're thinking about more than honeybees and we're thinking about native bees and other pollinators, some of those species want certain colored flowers or a certain shape um, of flower. And so we have to have lots of diversity in our mixture so that we're thinking about size, shape, and color to have the most benefit for the most species possible. And now I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about uh, monarch butterflies um, because great monarch butterfly habitat is also great habitat for honeybees. And I want to pass along a couple of things, a couple of updates, and a couple of things to think about related to monarch butterflies because when I am talking to monarch butterfly people, I tell them that the honeybee and beekeepers need to be your best friend because you both want the same kind of habitat. So tonight, talking to beekeepers, I want to tell you that the monarch butterfly and the people in our country that care passionately about monarch butterflies need to be your best friend because, again, what you both want for habitat on the landscape is exactly the same thing. So a couple of things about monarch butterflies. The first thing that probably most of us learned in ele way back in elementary school is that the monarch butterfly has a host plant to complete its life cycle. And that host plant is milkweed a plant from the Asclepius genus. This is, happens to be a photo of a common milkweed field 
that is providing great habitat for monarch butterflies. And when this photo was taken, it was absolutely alive with honeybees all over in it. Um, probably not a surprise to any beekeeper that's listening to this webinar tonight that milkweeds are a very highly sought after uh, plant by honeybees, and rightfully so. But this is a plant that is critical to the life cycle of monarch butterflies. And that's important because monarch butterflies are a species that over the last 20 years have experienced over a 90% decline, a significant decline. And if you take a look at the numbers that are on this graph right here, and it shows the general downward trend, I'm going to talk a little bit about these numbers and what they mean right here. This number right here of 1.13 hectares is the size of the area on the mountaintop in Mexico when the adult monarch butterflies go back there to make it through the winter. This is the size of the area that they comprise. So all of the monarchs in the eastern part of the United States go to that and they comprise and winter in an area that is just 1.13 hectares in size in 2015. How big is 1.13 hectares? Well, if you're not sure about the metric system, that is 2.8 acres in size. So think about all the monarch butterflies in the eastern population being into an area as small as 2.8 acres in size. That's not many uh, monarch butterflies left. Uh, each winter, the population is estimated, and this actually shows uh, the newest data right here from 2016, from the winter that we just went through. And we have a significant increase in monarch butterfly populations this last year. Uh, 2015 was a year that in the Midwest and Great Plains there was lots of common milkweed around, so it was a great year uh, for many reasons for monarch butterflies. So how is that population estimate arrived at? Well, when the, when the adult monarch butterflies in late summer migrate all the way back to the mountaintop in Mexico where they overwinter, this is an image from that mountaintop where all of those monarchs cluster together on the branches um, of those trees on the top of the mountain and uh, go into a form of hibernation. They cluster to share warmth and then uh, they conserve their energy by not moving. Here's an aerial photo of one of those areas. And when you look at this imagery, you can see this area right in here that has the orange color in it, that is that color because of all the monarch butterflies that are on those trees. So that is how the population is estimated by estimating the size of this area right here where the monarch butterflies are. So we just had a year where we had a significant increase in monarch butterfly populations. Here's one more photo of what they look like. And just when we think that we had a really nice increase in the population, on March 8th and 9th of this year, just after the population was estimated, a winter storm uh, that was an aberration, very rarely happens, came into the area and settled over the wintering grounds for the monarch butterfly and produced um, a snowstorm that uh, went in to the preserve uh, where the monarch butterflies are and had some rather devastating impacts on the monarch population prior to their migration back to the north in the United States. Significant numbers of monarch butterflies uh, perished in that storm. Some estimates are as high as 50% of the monarch butterflies that were overwintering in Mexico perished in that storm. So that's a little bit of uh, monarch butterfly background and information. And I want to leave you with four factoids to think about that I'll tie back to our uh, honeybee habitat and discussion here in the end. 
And the four factoids, the four numbers that I want to leave you with are these. 92%. 92% of the monarch butterflies that overwinter in Mexico started their life on common milkweed. A monarch butterfly can use many different forms of milkweed to start their life on, but common milkweed is by far the most important plant that is critical uh, to the monarch butterfly population. The next number for you to consider is 1.4 billion. And uh, the scientists have estimated that if we want to return the monarch butterfly population to the 20-year average, we need an additional 1.4 billion milkweed stems in the Midwest and Great Plains. 1.4 billion more than we have today. The next number that I would give you to think about is 73 times. In the year 2000, which for me wasn't that long ago, 16 years ago doesn't seem like it was that long anymore. In the year 2000, there were 73 times the number of monarch butterflies that started their life on agricultural land than in grasslands or other environments. Most of those monarch butterflies in the population back then started their life on milkweed that was growing in soybean and cornfields. And today, due to advancements in crop genetics and GMO crops, uh, Roundup Ready crops and things like that, milkweed has essentially been eliminated from agricultural uh, fields for corn, for corn and soybeans. So the most significant area where monarchs used to start their life uh, and increase their population from is essentially gone today. The next number to think about is 30. It takes an average of 30 milkweed plants to produce one adult monarch butterfly. And one of the reasons that it takes 30 to do that is because the average success of a monarch butterfly egg that is laid on milkweed, becoming an adult butterfly is just 2%. So 2% of the eggs that a monarch lays on milkweed has a chance of becoming an adult. So we need a lot more milkweed on the landscape uh, to increase that survival and success. So this kind of habitat can do it. And how do we have the best possible pollinator habitat on the landscape? Well, one of the ways that we do that is by thinking about how we design that habitat, what goes into our seeding mixture, and then making sure that we're managing that habitat. Because one of the rules of uh, wildlife management that is absolutely engraved in stone is there is nothing that you can plant and walk away from it and always have it look like this. Natural succession will take a high quality pollinator planting like this one and move it through natural succession so that it becomes more grass and less diverse. So we need to be thinking about using different management techniques to our pollinator habitat. Uh, and that is whether it's in your backyard or it's an entire field of pollinator habitat. So tonight I put just a couple of images in there for people to think about of what you can do to manage pollinator habitat, to have great pollinator habitat for many years to come. And the first one that I would talk about is prescribed fire. Most of our things that we would call pollinator habitat are all plant species that evolved with fire. Fire is a natural part of the ecosystem and is something that those plant species will benefit from. In an example like this, after a safe and effective prescribed fire is conducted on this area, you return the nutrients back to the soil and you encourage the growth and development of those many plant species 
that we want out there to have high quality pollinator habitat. So prescribed fire is one of the most cost effective, successful ways to have great pollinator habitat out there. And I think most folks watching the webinar tonight can probably look at images like these last couple of ones and know that there would be some real value in there for honeybees, native bees, monarch butterflies, grassland songbirds, pheasants, quail, lots and lots of different species. The next management technique that I would talk about is the use of green fire breaks. And this area in this image from here to here, this is called a green fire break. This was planted and established to lots of different legumes, alfalfa, red clover, yellow sweet clover, and things like that. So that when, as biologists, we decide that we want to burn this side of the field, but we don't want to burn over here, the green fire break acts as a management tool that helps us control where it goes so that we're not burning the whole thing. The side benefit is when we establish this to alfalfa, red clover, alcite clover, yellow sweet clover, it is providing huge pollinator benefits in addition to being a management technique to help us control fire. Great pollinator value in that green fire break. And if we have a larger piece of habitat, what we want to do is establish it in a manner where we're using the green fire breaks so that we can use fire in a rotation. In this example, the green fire breaks that are in here are put in in a manner so that this landowner can burn this square in year one, and then this one in year two, and then this one in year three and year four, and year five, and then in year six, and then you go right back to year one. So that after six years, you have that piece of property in six different stages of development and are always providing high quality pollinator value throughout that area. Another management tool that some people might not think is a great management tool for pollinator habitat would be the appropriate use of managed grazing. In this example, I have a photo of a pollinator project that had a prescribed burn conducted on it. And then as soon as it greened up, the area uh, had cattle brought into it, a high number of cattle for a very short period of time, in this case about two weeks. And what happens after that, once the cattle are removed, the area comes back and becomes established to a lot of diversity with a lot of forage value in there for pollinators. So cattle can be a great way of controlling our natural succession uh, so that we always have that area in a really highly diverse habitat that has great pollinator values. So next I want to now tell you a little bit about an exciting partnership that uh, Pheasants Forever is a part of that is putting high quality pollinator habitat on the landscape in this part of the world that is changing so fast with the changes on the landscape. And it's called the Honey Bee and Monarch Butterfly Partnership. And the Honey Bee and Monarch Butterfly Partnership was designed by three entities, Pheasants Forever, and then some real leaders in the Honey Bee world. Project APISM, another nonprofit uh, organization that has its focus on honeybees and does lots of great work with research and uh, uh, forage and nutrition projects. And the other uh, partner, the key partner in this, is uh, one of the leaders in the commercial honeybee world, Browning Honey Company, located in North Dakota and Idaho. And these three entities got together to talk about 
how we could make a difference on the landscape for the things that we care so much about. And so right now I'm going to tell you a little bit about this partnership and what it's doing. The partnership was formed with two key objectives. The first is, is that we want great habitat, forage, and nutrition on the landscape for pollinators, for grassland songbirds, for pheasants, for quail, but to design high quality, cost effective, pollinator habitat that would do well with landowners, provide great pollinator value, establish quickly, and be very cost effective. But there was one more uh, co-equal objective. The great habitat, forage, and nutrition, and the other co-equal objective was we wanted to design a program that would demonstrate here's what great habitat looks like. The that will provide great pollinator value and be cost effective. So the three entities designed this unique partnership to go forward and here are some of the things that this partnership brings to bear for landowners to think about enrolling in. The first is if you're a landowner that is enrolling in this program you will receive free pollinator mixtures. And in this example, if a landowner were to enroll 20 acres of habitat, 10 acres of it is established to a mixture that is high quality honeybee habitat, and 10 acres of it would be 10 acres of high quality monarch butterfly habitat. Both species benefit from both mixtures, but they're designed uh, differently and are planted in two separate uh, mixtures. So 50% of the acres are for honeybees, 50% are for monarch butterflies. A landowner enrolling in this program receives an annual rental payment, a compensation that they get each year for establishing that pollinator habitat. Another incentive that the landowner gets is they receive a planting incentive payment. That's a payment to cover their cost to go out and plant the seed mixtures that the program has provided them. Landowners that are enrolling in the program can select enrolling for three, four, five, or six years. And again, they'll receive an annual rental payment each and every year of that contract. A couple other very unique aspects of this are that the program has received broad financial support from commercial beekeepers, the honey packing industry, uh, agricultural industry, commodity groups, a number of different groups. We're really keenly focused on designing great pollinator habitat. We have to have the best possible habitat on the landscape that we can get. The USGS, the US Geologic Service, is uh, providing some services to us where they are helping evaluate the results of what we're getting out of the project. And then local beekeepers are helping to enroll the landowners by promoting the program to the landowners that they work with and uh, with in, in where they have apiaries on their land. The next update on the position, on the partnership, is I talked about how the habitat is established. 50% of it is established to a honeybee mixture, and that honeybee mixture is designed to consist primarily of legumes, alfalfa, red clover, yellow sweet clover, alcite clover, and many of the legumes that provide such phenomenal pollinator value to honeybees. The other 50% of the mixture is designed to a high quality, highly diverse native wildflower planting. And that part of the mixture contains milkweed species and things that are so key and uh, needed for monarch butterflies. So this is what each project would look like. Half of it is in a honeybee mixture, half of it is in a monarch butterfly mixture, both species benefit from both sides. 
I talked about earlier about the broad financial support for the program. In our first years, uh, the program has enjoyed really key financial support from a wide diversity of groups. Like I said, commercial beekeepers, the honey packing industry, agricultural industry, and many of the other groups that are listed on this page right here. And the area that is so critical to monarch butterflies is identified in this map right here. The areas that are highlighted in red, orange, and yellow have been identified as those parts of the country that if you want to increase the monarch butterfly population, those are the areas of the country where we need to be doing the work on the landscape. And that very closely aligns and meshes with those top honey-producing states in the country, North Dakota, South Dakota, and many of those other states. So there was a real clear overlap between providing high-quality honeybee habitat and high-quality monarch butterfly habitat. In our pilot program, we have been focusing on doing projects in North Dakota and South Dakota. In 2017, we will be expanding the program to these six states, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri. And with additional funding support, we hope in the future to expand the program even beyond that. So in our pilot program, where this program started one year ago in 2015, we have some early results with which to tell you about. Um, in our pilot program in just the two states, we have com completed 124 projects, and we have a waiting list of landowners wanting to get into the program. We have planted high-quality pollinator habitat on over 1,700 acres. The average landowner selected six years for their contract, and the average landowner planted 15 acres of pollinator habitat. And when we add up all 1,700 acres of that, we have planted 6.58 million milkweed seeds. So I'm going to flip past this slide since it's a video. How do we make that happen? How can we get more pollinator habitat onto the landscape? We have to find a way in which pollinator habitat can fit into the farm and ranch plan. And I think that that can happen pretty easily. Here's my example of what I'm talking about. This is um, a cornfield that is in production. And as you get closer to the edge of the field, you can see where the production in that field drops off. That's fairly natural. Uh, when you go in and you borrow one ear of corn from each row in that field, starting on the edge of the field, this is what that corn production looks like. And it's pretty easy to know that somewhere between here and between here is a sweet spot where if we were in, to enroll that into conservation, we're going to have uh, room where conservation can increase that farm and ranch income. And so here's what I mean by <clears throat> increasing farm and ranch income. I want to give you an example of how we worked with one Minnesota corn farmer on one field. In this example, this is a 181-acre field, and the actual yield monitor data for that field is listed over here, 181-acre acre, 181 field that averages 145 bushels per acre. But as is common, there are many areas within that field where the crop production falls far below 145 bushels per acre. This is not uncommon, and landowners have done what they've always done. I've, I amortize the low production areas of the field with the high production areas of the field and uh, spread that out across the whole field. In this example, we worked with this landowner and selected just those portions of the field where the crop production was pretty low 
and we worked with the landowner to enroll just those portions of the field into the Conservation Reserve Program, a program that would function much like our Honeybee and Monarch Butterfly Partnership Acres. By putting just those portions of the field where crop production is low because of soil type or topography or other environmental concerns, we have worked with that landowner and we have now some updated information on what their yield is and it increased significantly. So now let's look at the yield and the value of that one field for that landowner before and after enrolling just those small areas into CRP. The field acres remain the same, but the field average yield increased by over 8%. The profit on that field increased by 97%. The return on investment, 116%. The field expenses and the revenue decreased because a portion of that came out of crop production, but the total field profit increased by 97%. Folks, those are the examples of where we can work with agriculture to get pollinator habitat back into the landscape, working with agriculture to take just the areas that are less productive and enroll it into a form of conservation that establishes high quality, high diversity habitat and increases landowner income. This is a winning situation for the landowner, for beekeepers, for all pollinators and wildlife. This is a win, win, win. So with that, I'm going to kind of uh, start to wrap things up by giving you a couple of uh, final thoughts. And my first final thought for you tonight is that we have a moment in time right now, a moment in time when pollinator habitat and honeybees and monarch butterflies have captured the attention and concern of the public. We have a moment in time with which a presidential memorandum was written that talked about how the federal government is going to bring its resources to promote the health of honeybees and other pollinators. That's a unique event that is happening and is part of our moment in time. Right now, we have a moment in time to make things happen to the benefit of pollinators. I have one more final thought for you. And um, that is that related to the monarch butterfly that is currently under review to being listed as an endangered species, that thought is that endangered species listing for the monarch butterfly is simply not an option. We cannot let that happen. Monarch butterflies need more milkweed on the landscape to be able to increase their population. And one of the things that is a little bit sobering that maybe you're unaware of, but scientific modeling and recent research has determined that if we do nothing else for the monarch butterfly, nothing changes on the landscape, it stays the way it is today. If we don't add 1.4 billion more milkweed stems to the landscape, that there is a 60% likelihood that the monarch butterfly will become extinct in the next 20 years. A 60% likelihood. Folks, that's a sobering number. That's a sobering piece of data that I think that we have the ability to impact. And when I started this presentation tonight, I talked about where I uh, live and where I'm from and that I'm a landowner in central Nebraska and monarch butterflies being listed as an endangered species is not an option because of the impact that that would have on the landscape and in agriculture and a negative impact. It would Im negatively impact agriculture and it would negatively impact uh, the amount of 
uh, pollinator habitat that we have on the landscape. So and it's just not much of an option. We cannot let that happen. And I have one last final thought for you tonight as we get ready to conclude the webinar. And that is that whether you care about honeybees or monarch butterflies or pheasants or quail, whatever your critter is, whatever the thing is that drives your interest is, we need to use the there is safety in numbers plan. The there is safety in numbers plan is real simple. Whether you are a wildebeest on the plains of Africa with lions roaming around or you want more pollinator habitat to benefit your honeybees, we all need to get together because we all really want the same kind of habitat on the landscape. And what I mean by that is if we come full circle and we go back to the map that we started the webinar with and look at where that 24 million acres of grassland habitat that was providing pollinator value and has been converted into row crop production, if we look at where that area is, this part of the country is the most important part of the country for honeybees and for monarch butterflies and for native prairies and grasslands and birds and pheasants and quail. It is the most important part of the country for all of these different things and they all need the same kind of habitat. They all benefit from habitat that looks like this. So whether your passion is monarch butterflies or agriculture or pheasants or grassland songbirds, we can all benefit from this kind of habitat. And that concludes uh, my webinar for tonight. I would uh, close with uh, two things. One is that uh, Pheasants Forever uh, on a monthly basis produces video habitat tips that you can uh, look at. You can sign up to have a link emailed to you or you can sign up to view those habitat tips on the Nebraska Pheasants Forever YouTube page and I'd be happy to provide this information for anybody that uh, gets in touch with me. Many of our video habitat tips are about creating and managing great pollinator habitat and something that I think that uh, you would be pretty interested in. And this is my contact information, and I would be happy to chat with uh, anybody that has any questions about uh, tonight's webinar or wanted some more information. So I appreciate your time and energy tonight, and now I believe uh, we'll be answering some questions that Regina will pass along. Yeah, we do have several questions. If you do have any for, if you've thought of any, just put it in the question box, and I will get it to um, Pete. Um, are there any farm animals that eat milkweed? Um, actually, the many animals eat milkweed. Um, right now, um, as we reach the 1st of June, I can tell you that as you walk through the prairie or the grasslands, many of the milkweed species have been grazed on. Um, so it is something that wildlife find very desirable and do graze. Um, some landowners uh, worry about milkweed because if consumed in a very large quantity, it is cons the, the uh, fluid in milkweed is considered to be toxic to livestock, but you would have to consume a huge amount of it. And if, if all the deer are out there uh, eating it, it can't be that bad. Okay. What happened in 1997 where there was a dr dramatic drop in population of monarchs in the next year? Mm -hmm. Monarch populations are influenced primarily by three things. One, habitat. Do we have a year where there are lots of milkweeds around or not? The next thing would be drought. Uh, drought has a huge impact on monarch populations. And then the third thing is 
logging that is taking place on the mountaintop in Mexico where the monarchs overwinter. So we don't have the ability to control weather. Uh, the logging in Mexico is kind of being addressed and taken care of. So the one thing that we really can focus on trying to have an impact on is whether or not we have high quality habitat. And so that's the one thing that we kind of uh, have the ability to influence and that's the one thing that we try to focus on and that's something that Pheasants Forever is focusing on and we're also trying to do with our honeybee and monarch butterfly partnership that I talked about tonight. How easy, how easy is it to plant pollinator habitats for help? Um, pollinator habitat can be uh, pretty easy to do. The key considerations that you want to think about if you're um, motivated to put pollinator habitat in is one, make sure that you have the absolute best mixture that you can get, the high diversity, high quality uh, seeding mixture because the plants that you put in there, remember we want to think about April to October, the entire growing season, lots of different size, shape, and color. We want to have species that have high pollinator value and that sort of thing. Really put some effort into the mixture that you designed for that, and Pheasants Forever biologists would be available to help you with that. And the second critical component that you want to think about is your site preparation. If you want to put all the effort that you can into making sure that you are planting into the best conditions that you can, because if four or five years into the future you're unhappy with the quality of the pollinator habitat that you got, we don't have a time machine yet to go back and do it over again. So we really want to put a lot of time and effort into making sure we've done it right on the front end. And there's been a lot of talk about highway pollinator habitats not mowing everything down. What are your thoughts about that? Yep. Um, if you go back to one of my comments in the presentation was that we need to make every acre that remains the best that it can be. That's really what we're talking about with roadside habitat, right-of-way habitat. Those are areas that are in grasslands and things like that, and they have the potential to provide pollinator habitat for us. So we want to make sure that we're getting the best that we can out of those available options as well. And so um, very recently here, there has been some groups that have gotten together to try and establish great pollinator habitat along uh, Interstate 35 that runs north and south through the United States from Minnesota all the way down to Texas. And that can be a great opportunity to get great honeybee pollinator habitat on the landscape as well. Do you have any programs for folks that have less than 20 acres? You bet. The, uh, uh, first off, the Honeybee and Monarch Butterfly Partnership will enroll projects from one acre to 160 acres in size. So that will go smaller than that. Pheasants Forever has designed some special pollinator mixtures for backyard projects um, that are available. Um, so yeah, we absolutely have programs uh, that go a lot smaller, 20 acres. And uh, then there are lots of other conservation programs out there as well that can help to establish pollinator habitat. Some of them need to be on agricultural land, uh, but not all of them. So depending on where you're located in the country and what your objectives are, there should be uh, some sort of an option out there to help folks get great pollinator habitat on the landscape. OK. Any further questions for Pete? And while we're waiting for any other questions, um, some people have asked about the recording of this, it will be up on our website under the Conversations with a Beekeeper. Um, this is a true member benefit within ABF, and so we um, 
archive it along with all of our other webinars that we do. So not seeing any further questions. Pete, thank you so much for taking the time and, and informing us about well. all this great information and, and things that we really need to, to think about and, and have action items on. Yep. Thank you, Regina. I appreciate the ABF giving us the opportunity. Absolutely. We love uh, to partner with you all. Um, we do have a couple more webinars coming up in June, one on June 14th, Swarm Essentials, and June 28th on Prime Time with Honeybees. So take a look at those on our website. Um, again, if you uh, missed anything or want to listen to it again, we will archive it by Friday up on our website. Thank you all very much. Have a great evening. Hope to see you soon.